Okay, so then uh, should I start? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So it's two o'clock. It's time to start. Welcome everyone. Um, this is a webinar uh, organized uh, together with Fastlane and Sidereal. And the title, as you can see on the screen, is Don't Get iframes. So this will be all about iframes, all about uh, the client side and how um, iframes can be abused by the bad guys to achieve some nasty activities there. So click jacking and defenses. And um, <clears throat> this will be a one hour webinar. Um, uh, we may have some time at the end for the questions and answers. Uh, how this uh, then 45, 50 minutes of net presentation look, will look like. Uh, first of all, I will go through some um, basic things and basic ideas about uh, about software security, what it is all about, how we have to think about security in the context of software development, and then we will turn to the actual topic, which is clickjacking, and uh, I will even show you some defense techniques against the introduced um, uh, problem. So, um, Let's go for it. Introduction to software security, just to get into the mood, um, just to understand a little bit about it so that, uh, that you know what software security is all about. Um, actually, uh, we have to put together here two things. Thing number one, obviously, um, most security incidents, most security problems that, yeah, incidents that you can hear in the news are actually due to bugs developers commit all the time. Of course, we can have design issues as well. Uh, we can also have uh, the user not following certain best practices, but that's the other thing. Specifically from software development point of view, we can state that vulnerabilities, um, attacks are consequences of bugs. Fact number two, obviously, if you just remember Murphy's Law of Coding, Murphy's Law of Coding says in each non-trivial program, there is at least one uh, variable, one branch, one loop, and one bug. That is the essential uh, Murphy's Law. I pretty much like the extended version, which says that in each program, you actually have five bugs. And unfortunately, this number uh, does not depend on the number of the bugs you have already found. So bottom line is, there will always be bugs. Um, if you put these two things together, Thing number one, vulnerabilities and attacks are consequences of bugs, and there is no software without a bug, you can arrive to a very painful conclusion, which is basically that there is no such thing as 100% security. You simply cannot ensure perfectly, um, <clears throat> at least it's pretty, high, uh, pretty hard to ensure perfect security. There always will be bugs and uh, bad guys are will always actively just working on finding out how those bugs can serve their purpose, how they can um, attack your systems. And bottom line here is basically there is no unhackable system. This is pretty painful conclusion if you think about it. So this, this means that uh, no matter how much we do, they will always be able to attack uh, or to do something nasty. But it must sounds apocalyptically. Um, nevertheless, um, I also have some good news for you, which is that basically, according to several studies done by Gartner, by Microsoft, by some antivirus uh, providers, all of whom have large databases of, of incidents that did happen in the wild, they took a look, they did some statistics in these databases. And uh, interestingly, they came up with more or less the same number. Uh, namely 90%. So what is this 90%? They figured out statistically based on objective data that 90% of the incidents that happened in the wild were actually consequences of bugs that we already knew about for long. So what does this say? Actually, as I said, there is no 100% secure software. Um, any software can be hacked just if they want. It's more question of their motivation than uh, any kind of technical solution. However, if um, <clears throat> we follow the best practices, so if we write the code correctly as much as possible, we can, in theory at least, get rid of 90% of the incidents. And that 10% will always remain there. You can think about those 10, that 10% 10 and those incidents and those problems in code like the unknown unknown. So maybe even um, something which is considered to be a best practice today may turn out not to be the best practice uh, in a couple of years from now, because 
this landscape, so the whole uh, story of this cat and mouse game of, of them hacking our software and we protecting our code as much as possible. So that's a, that's a cat and mouse game and this landscape evolves continuously. So we learn and we develop ourselves in being better and better developers from security point of view. Unfortunately, of course, the, the dark side also develops. The dark side uh, also uh, comes up with uh, many new attack techniques continuously. So, um, uh, secure coding in this sense is basically about following the best practices. Um, and if you follow the best practices, then, as I said, you can get rid of 90% of the incidents and, and uh, the hacks. What is good news, especially for, for uh, when, when you are managing um, development groups, is that uh, following the best practices is more or less free. It's not perfectly free, of course, but um, uh, it's not like an extra week in a development project. It's not an extra person in the group, um, but it's basically about the same amount of time and the same amount of people writing code, but not writing it this way, but writing in that way. Simply changing the practices, changing how you think about the code, uh, and uh, knowing, of course, about all those tricks that should be applied, all those protection techniques should, that should be applied, and at the same time also knowing about the dirty tricks that the bad guys are uh, doing all the time. One of those is what we will discuss in the next couple of minutes. So if you quote uh, Bruce Schneier, uh, Bruce Schneier I don't know if you know who is Bruce Schneier, so he's a kind of celebrity, a very well-known guy. Um, he speaks at conferences, writes blogs, and, and uh, so on and so on. Um, he once said that the goal here is not even 100% perfect security, which we just agreed that we cannot have, but rather adequate security at a reasonable cost. So this is how you should think about it. You cannot reach a perfect security, but uh, there is an adequate level of security. There is even an optimum here, uh, which um, you can achieve above which even if you spend more on security, you will not gain more benefits uh, in that. The funny thing here is, um, and that's what we call the reasonable cost, right? The funny thing about uh, this is that I can even state, and this is again more for managers, uh, managing development groups, I can even state a number here. So the at the optimal level of security spending at the company is at 37% of the overall risk you you are facing. What is this 37%? Um, I don't want to go into details, but if you Google for Gordon Loeb model, it's L-O-E-B, Gordon L-O-E-B model, um, with uh, the appropriate mathematical means, they have uh, shown that uh, the optimal spending is at 37%. But anyway, that's not in the focus today. And also, if you look at uh, the, um, the story of software security from um, from game theory point of view, we also see many interesting things. First of all, software security is not a zero sum game. It's not that we win something and the same amount the bad guys lose, or that they win something something and then we lose the same amount of money or resources or whatever. Of course, partially this is true, but software security is actually an infinite game. So um, as it usually is in infinite games. Uh, it, the goal is not to beat the enemy. And as we have just seen, you can't beat the enemy. These are smart guys. These are smart people who are willing to attack your systems and they are looking for, for uh, all kinds of vulnerabilities and weaknesses through which they can do this. So you can't beat the enemy, but the goal in case of infinite games is simply to stay in the game. And um, if you translate that to the market and to software development, that basic staying in the game basically means staying on the market. So you should uh, uh, make efforts to to implement your software in as as much a secure way for one single reason, so that you become a well known um, vendor of products or services from security point of view and and a renowned uh, vendor, so that the market. Uh, will reward you by buying your services, buying your products, instead of services and products of those others who keep producing unsecure code. So the goal is to stay on the market, and it's all about your reputation on the market, just to name it. Uh, this is what I just described before. Um, if you keep getting into the news as, as a provider of software, which is getting hacked all the time, uh, of course, then uh, that will eat up your reputation 
and sooner or later you will be kicked out of the market if you don't deal with security of your code. So this is kind of the big picture, if you like, the galactic view to, to software security. So now let's deep dive <clears throat> into the actual topic of today's webinar, which is frame sandboxing. So as I said, it's all about frames uh, on web pages. It's all about iframes and it's all about <clears throat> either your code willing to put um, other pages on, on, uh, uh, in an iframe in your web pages or the other way around when other web pages are putting you your website in an I, into an iframe for some malicious uh, purposes we will talk about this later but of course the first one is also problematic so let me just show you uh, this um, or let me just uh, explain you this this image uh, here uh, top right so basically the first scenario I will not talk about is when your your web page is the blue one your your web page is always the blue one that's the good guy that's the good web page so you have a, a web page that you wrote and which is willing to put other pages which even the users can pick into an iframe and then your concern is about if you are putting some kind of uh, web page into an iframe set by a malicious user which will do something nasty with you here you have for that uh, specific problem you have many different protection techniques in browsers um, namely the same origin policy actually prevents any kind of interaction between uh, two frames the the outer frame so the big one which is in the browser and uh, the code or the page which is inside an iframe they simply cannot communicate easily they can of course but uh, both of the parties both if iframe and the page should <clears throat> contain certain code which would support this sending messages to each other and so on and so on um, but without this without both parties willing to do this same origin policy uh, implemented by browsers actually prevent any other kind of of uh, unwanted communication between the two frames which is good this is still good news but let's now focus on the on the on the on the scenario where where you don't really can't, you can't really do anything with this so this is a scenario where your web page which is the blue one is simply put in an iframe maliciously by the bad guys and the bad guys create some kind of malicious web page which maybe is not known as a malicious web page but still it does something nasty what do i mean by this let's say the bad guys craft a nice game pac-man game let's say let's let's uh, let it be a pac-man game and uh, people may even you know people will visit this website people like to pay, play pac-man but they will not know that in the background something very nasty will happen with some other web pages uh, of the victim um, so here again um, a pac-man a malicious pac-man game that people visit and start playing even though if that uh, uh, pac-man game puts your website your victim page uh, into an iframe uh, interaction based on JavaScript for example so any kind of interaction between the two frames is not allowed by by the browsers so here also the same origin policy actually prevents any kind of interaction which is again pretty good except if we have some uh, a bug in the implementation of the browser um, and this is what happened earlier in Internet Explorer pretty old versions um, and Internet Explorer as such has been uh, has been uh, 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 basically obsolete just last week so it's end of the Internet Explorer era and this is also uh, um, furthermore a an old version it had a bug which actually allowed the outer frame to steal to uh, to steal the keystrokes that you did in the in the inner frame neither this should be possible um, and even this is of course um, stopped and prevented by today's browsers but there was an implementation problem in the browser uh, in this specific version of Internet Explorer which allowed unfortunately um, an outer frame to steal so just imagine if you if you uh, typed in your password click by click the outer frame could actually steal your keystrokes and learn what your password is so this should not be possible of course this was just a bug Okay, so much about browsers. Again, we could talk about same origin policy for long, what that is and how, what are the details of that implementation provided by browsers. But let us now see the actual problem, which is in the focus of today's webinars, 
uh, which is clickjacking. So what is clickjacking? I said that no JavaScript, direct JavaScript based um, interaction is possible between the two frames. So if they put you in an iframe, uh, the blue one, and they try to do something nasty and uh, try to interact with you, it would not work. However, <clears throat> uh, this very smart attack technique called clickjacking actually makes uh, use of the human in the loop. So here, the malicious JavaScript cannot do anything with the blue page, any kind of data in the blue page. It cannot steal data from the blue page. It cannot change anything in the blue page, in the victim page. However, uh, it can play the, its cards smartly, actually tricking the user to do the attacker a favor and reveal uh, some uh, secrets or possibly um, do something nasty in the blue frame, something that the attacker wants to achieve. Uh, this is called clickjacking because in the original version of this attack, um, it was actually the goal of the attacker to make the victim to click on a button, some, uh, one single button somewhere on the internet, without the user actually willing to do this. The user didn't want to, but the user does not want to click on the button. But with a dirty trick, we make the user to do this for us as if we are the attacker. How this can be achieved? Um, what the attackers have to do is uh, that they, again, craft a malicious web page, which puts the hidden, uh, which puts the victim page with the desired button to be clicked on in a hidden iframe. Um, and of course, the, the cover story should be something which attracts visitors. So, for example, craft a web page which, uh, which tells you, okay, uh, you can click, uh, you can win one million euros or dollars or whatever. Uh, just click here and click on this button and you may be the lucky winner of $1 million or whatever. So this is basically some kind of social engineering here. You have to craft some kind of website which is appealing, which people will visit. Then the victim page containing the button you want the, the user to click on, you put into the iframe. Moreover, you can even crop that uh, page just to contain the, 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 the button and nothing else. So there is a button uh, which is in the iframe and the iframe is made hidden so that the user will not know that there is a button uh, somewhere on the page which comes from another page. That's the blue one. The red one is the cover story. That's the how to win million dollars, right? And then as part of the dirty trick, the last element of the dirty trick is that you make the this hidden iframe to follow the cursor continuously. How to do this? You basically have to uh, register into, into, the, into the red malicious page, an on-mouse move event handler in JavaScript. And this on-mouse move uh, will be triggered anytime somebody moves the mouse, right? Uh, you have the blue iframe containing a button, which is invisible, which is hidden. And you make, whenever on-mouse move is triggered, you recalculate the coordinates of this uh, blue hidden iframe and you make that iframe to follow the cursor. So as the, as the user moves the cursor around, there is a hidden iframe always behind the cursor, underneath the cursor. So the only thing that the user will do whenever the user clicks anywhere on the page is to click on the button. And this is why we call it clickjacking. So it's good for hijacking a click. And of course, um, uh, we will not have time to go into more details, but uh, with the same trick. So just to repeat once again, a hidden iframe following the cursor, containing some kind of action, some kind of element that the user wants, uh, the, the attacker wants the user to interact with. Uh, so hidden iframe following the cursor, that is the main idea here. And as I said, in the basic uh, state, it is about just hijacking a click on a button. What this button can be? A like button. So the easiest way how you can um, collect likes on, on, on Facebook or, or wherever is um, to make such an attack, to make such a trick, um, make an appealing website uh, and uh, basically make people to click on your like button. And uh, in no time, you can actually collect uh, millions and millions of, of likes. Why not? Um, so or retweeting a message. Uh, if you want your message to reach many users, you can just uh, put your message there with the retweet button uh, into the hidden iframe. And if uh, they just play the Pac-Man game or do whatever they have to do, what is the cover story, they will just 
uh, retweet your messages. So um, I usually like to say that a um, now they say that uh, an image is worth thousand words, and my addition to this, which we obviously uh, uh, and for obvious reasons apply on our courses, is that a lab is uh, or a demonstration is worth thousand images. So uh, if you didn't get the point still, and um, you just uh, try, I suppose, to imagine what this is all about. Let me show you um, our lab framework, and in this lab framework, I will demonstrate to you um, this clickjacking because when you see it, it's much clearer than um, than if I just describe this attack technique. So what you see here is our lab framework. It's a full-fledged uh, Linux virtual machine um, in which um, this happens to be a Python uh, web application, but the same story stands for you know Java, for C sharp, for for PHP, for for any other technologies and programming languages. Um, so you see here the IDE, the integrated development environment. Again, in this case, we happen to use a Visual Studio code. And on the right side, you see our uh, uh, educational technology, if you like, which is Agile Attendant. Um, I already logged in here. Um, it's a plugin uh, it is, that is available for uh, the most uh, popular IDEs like uh, IntelliJ IDEA, Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, and so on and so on. So let me just uh, um, select the click tracking lab and let me start it. Okay, so the click tracking lab, um, first of all, whenever I start the lab, uh, 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 it opens all the necessary files. And as you can see here on the right, uh, it is basically a, a chatbot. So the Sidel attendant I referred to earlier is a chatbot that gives me instructions about how to do the specific steps of the lab. Uh, what it opened me already here in the editor is actually an attack page. So this GDPR HTML is the malicious web page. So this is the red web page you see on the screen. This is the red code, the code of the of the bad guys who already prepared this attack. Um, uh, they bring in some uh, thing, uh, some page uh, uh, on an iframe. Of course, this is localhost 5000, but whatever. That's the malicious. So this is the blue frame. So this is the this is the blue. Uh, web page that we are attacking and obviously we are clipping it so we are clicking clipping uh, it uh, to get only the button we want the victim to click on and what this button is I will I will uh, explain you right away so this is the iframe uh, as you can see it's not perfectly uh, invisible so in a real life attack it will be a, an invisible iframe clipping a rectangle which contains just the button and nothing else uh, from this page, this is the victim page, just to repeat once again. In this specific case, for demonstrational purposes, we only uh, made it opaque. So you still see, aha, so there is a hidden iframe, not hidden, uh, but normally there is a hidden iframe, which um, uh, follows the cursor as I move the mouse all around. And obviously, as a consequence of this, anytime I click uh, anywhere on the page, I will basically click on that button, which is part of this web page. And just to show you quickly, um, we are the bad guys. I mean, not we, we are not the bad guys. Uh, the bad guys already registered an on mouse move event handler, which is this follow mouse. And as you can see here, it does all the magic with the coordinates. Um, so to make the, the hidden iframe to follow the cursor. Okay, so this is the attack, but Sidus' uh, attendant here on the right tells me something else. Please start drill cam. So I'm starting now the web application. DrillCamp is actually a web application that is full of bugs. Um, so it was a funny development project to develop something which is intentionally as bad as possible. So this DrillCamp is the context of, of our teaching web application security. As you can see, this is a very simple, well, mediocre simple website. Um, the cover story of this website is like Airbnb or Booking.com. So basically, you can find in this website certain hotels. Um, certain um, uh, uh, hostels or apartments all around the world uh, you can choose from if you want to travel to some some resorts or somewhere. If I click on here, you can see Mangrove Bay Resorts. It's in uh, Illinois Avenue in St. Petersburg. This is St. Petersburg, Florida, not the Russian one, but the Florida St. Petersburg. Um, in Tampa Bay, I usually tell people like if you happen to be in uh, this uh, 2084, 82 Illinois Avenue, like don't go there. 
uh, this is not what you will find there. This is all fake. So this is a fake database. This is a mock database uh, with all fake data, but just the playground for us to present all kinds of security problems. So um, this is the cover story. And now let's go for click jacking. Um, uh, Sidus uh, attendant says here, login as George. Uh, George is usually the bad guy. He's the uh, he is the bad guy uh, uh, who hacks this system all uh, uh, all the time. So we have to log in as George. So let me just type in George and George's password. This so he has an account to this drill camp. Um, yeah, secret PW. You can see lots of lots of problems here, like uh, you know showing the password. And so this is as bad as possible, as I said. So let's log in. And now, as you can see, Sidewheel Attendant waits until I do the next step. And then once I'm, uh, I do the step, I accomplish the step, it gives me the instructions step by step. So now that I'm logged in, um, I have to add a new property to the system. Uh, you will understand why right away. So I'm abusing here a functionality where I can, as, as a valid user in this uh, account or in this website, I can add a new hotel. Now I will, I will add, as, as the bad guy, I will add a hotel, which I will call GDPR. It's a hotel, price, whatever, 11 euros, uh, rating, whatever. I don't have to actually fill it in because I'm doing this for one single purpose, just to repeat once again, I'm the bad guy now. I'm doing this for one single purpose, to upload a picture to this hotel. Now, as a picture of this hotel, I will actually not pick a nice image of the hotel because it's a fake hotel. It's not a real life hotel. It's just a fake hotel. But I will pick an image, which will be this uh, GDPR HTML. It is the actual GDPR HTML I just shown you. So this one, I will upload HTML code and HTML file as an image. If it does work, then I will get this GDPR HTML to act as part of the web page, which obviously it is not. I just added this to the web page. And this is another problem which we will not discuss this time, which is file upload and all the risks and all the all the problems related to the file upload uh, issue. But now I'm uploading an HTML file as an image to a new hotel. And I obviously got this new hotel. I haven't provided any kind of uh, any kind of um, uh, address for it. We could put it in Frankfurt. We could put it anywhere. As you can see, price is there. And the image is obviously broken because that's not a JPEG file. That's not a BMP file. It's actually a uh, HTML file. But if we click on inspect and uh, if I click here, you can see that it is placed at slash static slash upload slash picture slash GDPR HTML. So it for for a non not so um, aware user, this may even look like a valid web page of this uh, drill cam. So now the attacker is done. Basically, George, as the attacker, managed to upload an HTML five file to the page, and now uh, that page actually acts as 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 a malicious page within the drill cam. So that uh, that is part of this story of this lab. Now I can log out, and now we, as I log out, now we switch hats. Now I will be I will become the victim. So the victim will have to log in. Now I will log in as John. John's password is trust no one. And now that I'm logged in as John, side attendant wants to show me something. John can of course delete any of his properties. Let's visit the La Roche Hotel. So this is the second hotel here in the row of the hotels. Let's click on this one. As you can see, I'm logged in as John Smith. That's a random user in, of this website. And this hotel, which happens to be in Morocco, right? If I remember well, yes, in Morocco, in uh, Rabat. Um, so this hotel um, is actually being advertised by John Smith. Therefore, John Smith has a nice delete button here. So if I visit any other page, uh, any other hotels as John Smith, which are not mine, I will not be able to delete them. But here, there is a delete button. It's another question like if the delete button's functionality, so if the REST endpoint is actually equipped with the appropriate authorization for, for me being John Smith or not, but that's another question once again. So for the moment, let's just note that there is a delete button on this web page, which is localhost 5000 slash details ID equals to two. Do you remember what was the page that we that the bad guys did introduce into their code? Let me show you once again. 
it's exactly this one. So it's not only this one, but we are creeping the rectangle of the delete button here. So with this trick, now we will make uh, John Smith, if he is logged in, we will make John Smith to delete one of his hotels, even though he doesn't want to do this, but uh, this is the trick. So uh, now John Smith actually receives an email saying, hey, Mr. John Smith, um, may we ask you to accept our GDPR policy? We have updated the GDPR policy. This is the cover story. So this is the obviously a fake email, uh, not a fake email, I mean a malicious email sent by the bad guy to John. John will click on the link in the email and that will drop him to a page as something like this. This is, as you can see, localhost 5000 static uploads pictures GDPR HTML. This is what John Smith, uh, this is what George, actually the bad guy, uploaded to the, to the, to the, to the website. And it more or less looks like for, for, for an un, uh, unaware user, this more or less looks like a valid web page of DrillCamp. And you see the trick here. I hope you can see it very well. I can even uh, zoom in. So as you can see, uh, basically, no matter how I move the mouse, and this is opaque, just to, re re uh, just to remind you, but in a real life attack, this will be a perfectly invisible iframe. So this is an iframe. Uh, this is not an invisible, but an opaque iframe in this case. And with the on mouse move trick in just GDPR HTML, which is uploaded uh, by the bad guy maliciously and crafted, of course, by the bad guy maliciously, uh, with the on mouse move, we made this iframe to follow the cursor uh, all the time. And of course, me as John Smith, who don't know anything about this, I clicked on this GDPR HTML and I want to accept the uh, cookie policy or whatever GDPR statement or just I have to make a click on this website. So if I go here and make a click on the website, of course, the page says thank you for accepting the cookie policy. But of course, in the background, something nasty has happened. What did happen is that uh, John Smith, let me go back, John Smith actually clicked on the delete button. Uh, this it still is an open page, but if I go back to drill camp uh, opening page, as you can see, there is no uh, La Roche Hotel anymore. So uh, the attacker was able to make me as the victim, John Smith, to delete one of my hotels, even though I didn't want to do that. So this is why this is called click jacking, because this uh, pretty much front end trick uh, allows the bad guys to hijack a click of a button and I just deleted this La Roche Hotel. So this was the demonstration and I hope that by, by seeing this now you see the problem it's in its entirety. So we have seen the problem. And as usually it is in the courses for each and every problem, we show the problem, then we show attack techniques at the, the dirty tricks, not to turn developers to the dark side, of course, but to, just to make developers aware that if your code stays like this, well, this is what will happen. Um, and of course, then the focus is on the best practices. Um, this is not even the full slide set of all the best practices. So we will just highlight a couple of these uh, ideas, what you need to do, what you can do and what you should do moreover, obviously, um, as best practices to protect against this problem. Um, obviously, you have to do something um, on the server side. And one thing that you can do is to protect your pages against being framed by other pages by introducing an HTTP header. Uh, this HTTP header is part of the content security policy set of headers introduced originally by uh, Mozilla Foundation, but then taken over by all of the browsers today. So this became a, a de facto a kind of standard you know, on the web. Um, so content security policy has many different values th through which you can govern many different things actually uh, related to security of your web pages. One of those parameters and values you can use with content security policy is frame answer stores. Frame answer stores is a keyword you can use with none, with self or with some specific domains saying only well, obviously if you put none, frame answer stores none, that means nobody can frame you. This page is sent from the server to the browser, indicating to the browser, hey, browser, this page is not allowed to be framed. And the browser will then refuse to put it in an iframe. So the only way you can see and visit this page is if it is the main frame or in the browser. But if somebody tries to put that in an iframe, that would simply not work. If you put self, that means my own pages can put my own other pages into an iframe, but nobody else. That would be the most common. 
or you can also whitelist, you can also allow list your friendly pages to whom you do allow to put you in an iframe and nobody else will be able to do so. And of course, there is a star here, which means you can combine this. Of course, it doesn't make semantically, it doesn't make any sense to combine none with anything else, but you can say self and www.myfriendpage.com or something like this. So this is how the HTTP header should uh, look like in the HTTP response. And obviously in different programming languages, there are different ways how you can put uh, HTTP header values into, into your pages, into your responses. Um, the older version before content security policy existed, um, uh, we also had a solution for this. It was called X-Frame Options. It was also a, a um, HTTP header, but of course it has been deprecated by the content security policies uh, frame ancestors. And if you have such a situation, it's always a good question like, okay, if you have both, uh, because obviously as a developer, it, it's a good idea to put both of these HTTP uh, uh, header values into your responses because you can't know if the user will use an older browser or a newer one. Of course, it should be a very, very old browser to not to know about content security policy, but anyway. But then from the browser's point of view, it's always a good question, like what happens if in a web page, in a response, you have both of these? Which one should be taken into account, especially if they contradict? Um, so the extreme options tells something different than the than the frame ancestors, and it's pretty obvious that the content security policy is the newer that should overshadow the other one. But we have seen some bugs or mistakes done by by Mo Mozilla Foundation as well as uh, Google, because in Chrome 40 and Firefox 35 they introduced this, but um, unfortunately it was the other way around. So if you had a content security policy, still then the extreme options was taken into account, which obviously was a mistake. But still, uh, it turned out to be this way. So this also shows you why we don't stop here, because you may say, OK, so we just have to put an HTTP uh, response, HTTP header in my responses, and then I'm done. I cannot be framed anymore. But there are cert certain problems. Uh, in this, if you go for this protection, you depend on the browser. And as you can see, many different browsers may exist out there. Uh, they can have many different problems in their implementation. Who knows uh, how it will turn out to be? So if you are a front-end developer, you, you should know about the struggle of, of you know, pleasing all the browsers um, with, with everything. So, so that's, one, that's one of the problems. The other problem is that um, you have to be careful if you do want to be framed by some multi-domain uh, multi sites uh, of yours. Um, if you happen to run in the cloud and so on and so on, so then you have to use frame ancestors carefully because you may lose certain functionality if you're using iframes in your pages, framing your own pages. Of course, uh, then you could put self, but what is self if you have a multi-domain page? It will not be self anymore, so you have to state then uh, whitelisted domains, and it may be tricky in some cases. And also various, there are some proxies and intermediate nodes that tend to uh, strip HTTP headers or add or replace HTTP headers, which is pretty nasty thing, but uh, there are some elements which do this um, and they can manipulate even your HTTP headers, uh, possibly uh, uh, dismissing some of the protection techniques that you may be used. Pretty unfortunate, but, but it can happen. So this is why actually we don't stop here and um, actually we can even go for um, some self-made um, protection techniques, which we implement in JavaScript. So this is something you can put in your web page um, and it's called frame busting. So what is frame busting? Basically a single line of JavaScript code that you put into your web page, which is run whenever your web page is loaded into the browser. And this JavaScript code uh, line will simply do, uh, will do a simple thing. Check if I am the top frame. If I am the top frame, I'm happy. If I'm not the top frame, then I reload the whole page, basically making myself the web, uh, the, the the main page uh, uh, of the uh, of the of this uh, of the, in the browser. So one possible implementation of this you can see here. So if top not equals to self, so if I'm not the top frame, then top location href should be set to self location href. This is why we call it frame busting because basically if the JavaScript detects that it is being framed, so it is running in an iframe. It busts out and and uh, and basically reloads the whole stuff, making itself the main page. There are many ways how you can do this. Um, so the check as well as the reload of the page. 
Um, and there are some good ways and there are some bad ways. And this is what we will discuss in the next couple of uh, uh, next slide, basically, because we don't have too much time to go further. So, as I said, software security is pretty much about uh, is, is pretty much a cat and mouse game. So we protect and then the bad guys try to figure out how to circumvent the protection technique or overcome or kill, even kill the protection technique. So we do frame busting and then the bad guys will start doing anti-frame busting. So with what is anti-frame busting? They will try basically to somehow kill the functionality that you have put into your web page. So you try to protect against click jacking by adding a single line of JavaScript into your pages. Then the attackers are now interested in killing this uh, line of JavaScript somehow. And this is a pretty long story. Uh, we will cut it short a little bit. So first idea for anti-frame busting is if you happen to use uh, not top location here, but parent location somehow in the check, which is considered to be a mistake, you will see right away why. And then the problem with parent location is that if you use parent location here, in your frame busting code, which may be a valid thought, um, the attacker will do um, double framing. So the attacker will put an iframe into an iframe, and in that iframe, uh, they will put your web page, uh, the blue one, if you remember from the first figure. Um, so they will do double framing. Why this is well, this is a problem? Because using actually parent location in a double frame page uh, actually violates um, certain policies in the browser, namely the uh, descendant frame navigation policy, which says that the frame uh, can navigate only to its descendants. And if the parent location is not your descendant and you try to do there, basically it will break. So in the console, you will see some kind of JavaScript error. And basically with this double framing, the attacker will stop your frame busting code to be active and to do its job. It will not reload itself. So this is just the starting point of the, of the journey over the counter attacks. The next idea that attackers can do, even if you use top location and self location, but not parent location, is to for the attackers to register an on before unload into their red website. So you have the red website, the you know the Pac-Man game or the how about winning the one million dollar uh, uh, website or whatever is the cover story, or GDPR policy acceptance, right? Uh, so in the red page, uh, the attackers will um, register an on before unload event. What is on before unload event? On before unload event is basically triggered whenever the page is left behind, right? Closed. Now, obviously, this reload, page reload, if you are not the top self, uh, if you are not the top page, uh, page reload will trigger the on before unload because you are closing the old page and you are reloading the page for you to be the main page from that point on. Um, and on before unload will be triggered. What uh, what uh, you can do, what the attackers can do in an on before unload, better to say. Uh, I don't know if you know about on before unload because usually you use on before unload to, you know, close some things in the web page. Like if you had a web socket or you had a web worker, you can stop it there. You can you can you can stop any kind of background processing in the on before unload or do some kind of cleanup or whatever. But um, it's not well known and not widely used, but the on before unload event handler can actually return a string. Now, if you return a string uh, from the on before unload event handler, that is an indication for the browser, hey, ask the user this question and the user should decide for an OK or a cancel. This is usually used to something like, hey, you are leaving our domain. Goodbye. It was nice to see you. If you are okay with this, we don't take any responsibility for you anymore. Just click on OK. If you want to stop reloading this page, uh, just click on Cancel. This is the usual use case of this on before unload returning a string. Now, in this specific case, the attacker is in control. The attacker will ask the user something frightening, and this is pure psychology. The attacker will put into this string something like, hey, if you continue, this will cause a security problem your data may be lost, uh, your documents may be gone. Boo, basically, a frightening thing. Are you sure? And the attack and the and the victim, the, the user will say, oh, what's going on? No, 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 I, I, don't, I, I click on cancel. And that clicking on cancel is exactly what the attacker wanted you to do. So yet another case, but this is psychology and not technology. Yet another case when the user is fooled, the user is fooled with a frightening question and the user will click on cancel and will be, the user will be the one 
who will basically, basically stop the page um, load. So this is a very, very dirty trick, and there's many other dirty tricks, but just to uh, just to conclude with this, yeah, you have clobbering where in certain browsers, at least, you could actually uh, overload or, or override the location um, uh, by uh, creating a location um, named variable, and this is normally not possible, but in some browsers this was allowed like in Internet Explorer 7 or Safari 404 specific versions, uh, but then they realized that this is not a good idea. Uh, bottom line is, if the attacker basically um, um, overwrites or over um, defines the location, uh, that would be the window location, uh, that would also um, uh, stop basically the stop location to be set, because that uh, now becomes a uh, simply just a variable in your JavaScript, and basically, uh, even if you have an iframe which is protected uh, against um, click jacking with, with anti frame busting, when top location is set, it will just set a variable, a random variable, uh, and will not do a, a page reload. Basically, again, this is uh, killing the anti frame busting, uh, the frame busting code of yours. Similarly, in Safari, you could over you can you could define a setter method for the location. Again, this is not something which is part of the standard JavaScript uh, language or or uh, the web engines. It is not implemented, but it was implemented as a kind of trial in in Safari, and um, that again means that if you define a setter method for the location and do nothing in this setter method, that means that a top location href setting will not at all uh, trigger any kind of page reload. Um, and also, um, you could abuse sandboxing. So again, if you're using an iframe, I don't know if you know about sandbox, that's an attribute you can use in your pages. That's more for the other protection technique against the other problem, which I started the story with, when the blue frame is putting some red uh, pages in the red frame. So when you are willing to put some, some other pages into an iframe, and you are afraid of those web pages, then you can restrict them, you can run them in a sandbox, for example, disallowing them to run any kind of JavaScript. Now, this is exactly the problem, and this is exactly a protection technique against the reverse problem, which can be abused by the bad guys here for uh, to kick out the protection technique against this problem. What do I mean by this? So the attacker will put the victim page, the blue one, into the red page by putting a sandbox and an empty sandbox attribute with, with no values. Why this is beneficial? Because that means that the victim.com will not be able to run any kind of JavaScript, including, of course, the frame busting JavaScript. And in some cases, this may work and this may, again, still show a button and that button uh, can be still clicked. So we put a smiley here because this is basically the situation where a protection technique invented for against something else comes in handy for the attackers to kick out the protection technique against uh, certain uh, problems. So, as I said, this is a cat and mouse game, and here we see the cat and mouse game uh, at its best. Um, so, as you can see, um, frame busting is important, uh, but also frame busting has lots of lots of loopholes and problems. Luckily, however, we can uh, do it smartly. So, frame busting is not a bad idea. Uh, but still, we have to do it smartly. We have to change the logic. And this, as you can see, is the best practice against clickjacking. Do frame busting. Of course, in addition, you can also do the, uh, the HTTP, so the content security policy HTTP header. You should do that, as well as you could do and should do uh, anti-frame busting, but in this way. What is the correct way? Um, it's reverse logic. You don't check if you are the top frame, uh, if you are not the top frame, but the other way around, you check if you are the top frame. Um, this is also connected to a very important thing from, from security point of view, namely that you can have allow lists and you can have deny lists. So basically enlisting the good cases and enlisting the bad cases. Enlisting the bad cases is always dangerous because you cannot know if you enlisted everything. Again, I will not go into this. This is a very interesting um, set of high-level principles uh, about security. By the way, uh, if you are not familiar with allow listing or deny listing, formerly they were known as whitelisting and blacklisting. So this is the same concept. Anyway, so what we do here is that we prepare a web page always in a way that we put into the CSS, we define a style 
uh, we call it anti-click jacking, which defines that the body display should be none. That means that no matter what, you always show, uh, you always download the web page. So create a web page and send it to the browser with uh, uh, basically display none uh, body, which means it's an empty page, nothing to be displayed. There is a body, but it's not display, not shown. And this not showing this is a different than than having opacity of zero. Uh, so this is not only an invisible uh, set of elements which are there. These elements are not there. So by default, the web page is sent to the browser with this display none. And then as part of the web page, a small piece of JavaScript, as you can see, it's not just a single line anymore, but it's uh, four, five, six lines. Of course, we compressed a little bit uh, it to fit into this frame. So we do a reverse logic. We check if the self is the top, if we are on the top frame, which makes us happy because that means no click jacking. This is business as usual. Then we basically delete the anti-click jacking from the CSS, so from styles. So we get the anti-click jacking um, element and we delete it. And this means that then at this moment, all of a sudden, all elements will become visible. If, however, so in the else branch, we say, if we are not the top frame, then we do the classic uh, uh, frame busting. Why this is much better? Because now if somebody with an anti-frame busting trick tries to kill this against most of those tricks that we have discussed uh, earlier, um, if they try to kill this, um, uh, Basically, um, then everything will remain actually with display none, invisible, and uh, the click jacking trick will not work. So uh, this is the best practice. Um, best practice always means that at least to say we cannot guarantee that in the future no bad guys will figure out something against this as well. But for the moment, at least to say, or the best thing I can say about this is that this is the best practice because we don't know about any problems yet about it. Uh, who knows? Okay, so this is the best practice. And uh, let me just conclude with the lab. Um, in this lab, I will fix the real camp code. So I will click on the next lab, which is using CSP. I will go the easy way this time. I will not do anti-frame busting because time is already running up. I will just um, fix the source code of um, of this drill camp by adding the content security policy header. In this specific case, um, Sidious Surgeon helps me to edit the source code. Sidious Attendant helps me to um, uh, edit the source code. As you can see here, I even have some help. So if I go here above this line, which is underlined, it tells me, so it's not only a chatbot uh, at this moment, but also it tells me a little bit more detailed things about, hey, um, the app after a rec requests a decorator. So this is pretty much Python uh, th uh, things here, but uh, the same story stands for Java and for, for C Sharp and for other programming languages. So it tells me what to do in more details. So let me just follow that. Um, so I will just put the response headers. Uh, I will have to put uh, content, uh, content security policy header. And uh, I have to set it to frame ans uh, ancestors none. Okay, so this is what uh, what you can see here simply as added content security policy header set value to uh, 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 frame ancestors none. And when I save this, then it says it looks good. How about we restart drill camp? So now I will re redeploy drill camp. And the only thing I changed is to add this uh, frame ancestors none. And if I redeploy drill camp and restart the web application, I will see the effect of these changes. And now, um, yeah, so Sidious Sergeant opened me uh, the very same website uh, that I've seen before. Of course, we already deleted the, uh, the La Roche Hotel. Uh, so this is an empty, empty uh, iframe, but we still can see, I hope you can see it as well. So we can still see the empty iframe here, but uh, not only because we already did the trick, uh, we cannot uh, delete the La Roche Hotel anyway, because it's deleted already. But let me show you in the console, um, the browser dropped us an error message saying um, the content security policy actually prevented uh, this iframe to be loaded into so this page this uh, url to be loaded into the into an iframe simply 
because the page responded with the three months stores none and that meant I should not put this under any circumstances I should not put this into an iframe so this is the result this is the effect of that um, simple and single um, HTTP response header that we added to the page which now stops uh, click checking so uh, this is the end of the story as I said this was somewhat um, uh, shortened story because there are many other counter attacks uh, that we didn't discuss but basically and of course i haven't shown you the anti-frame busting solution in practice but you have uh, learned about that in theory so just to conclude uh, with a couple of thoughts about uh, our training um, uh, curricula um, i already mentioned that the usual flow on our training is um, that we follow we go through four stages whenever we discuss something stage number one is of course always to discuss the uh, the problem in the code this is what we discussed in the first slide so mainly you have seen this story in this webinar we discussed the problem then i've shown you attack techniques again just to repeat once again not to turn you to the dark side but to you know to make you as well as to make developers understand um, the risk associated to leaving the code bad, uh, leaving the code vulnerable, so that they see what will happen if they don't follow the best practices. Then, of course, stage number three, we show the best practices, and stage number four, then we even, uh, sorry, and then as part of stage number three, first of all, uh, first to finish with that one, we also um, fix the source code of the web page, of the vulnerable web page, so we fix the problem as we have learned about it, uh, as part of stage three and then we see that if we if we fix it and in most of the cases it's a very simple fix like adding a line here or a line there uh, then the problem is gone so the attack technique that we have seen before does not work anymore and the stage four this is the last stage in most cases we bring in real life case studies like have you heard about i don't know google being hacked ashley madison being hacked sap being hacked um, whichever company being hacked. These are not, in some cases, these are not real life incidents. These are just uh, vulnerabilities and bugs found by ethical hackers, by, by, by researchers, if you like, um, reporting uh, these problems to the companies. So these were real life vulnerabilities and real life stories. Not all of them has been abused by the bad guys in reality. One example, which was a real life hack, which really costs a lot of money, was how they have the British Airways, for example. That's also pretty interesting. Otherwise, also a front end uh, or a JavaScript related story. So we bring in real life case studies. As you have seen, the courses are pretty interactive and, and uh, hands on. So for all of these problems, we, we have a lab uh, where people can even try out hacking techniques and protection techniques. And um, we also have, besides the instructor-led training, we also have uh, e-learning for continuous uh, self-education. So the same material can be presented with the trainer and can be followed in an e-learning manner as well. So the catalog uh, you can find on fastlanece.net, um, Sidereal Secure Coding. So as I already mentioned, this is a cooperation between Sidereal and Fastlane. The programming languages we cover are C, C++, Java, C Sharp, Python for the moment. Um, we also have some uh, special training for testers, for developers, of course, for developers, but also for testers when we show them, okay, if you want to find this type of problem, this is how you have to approach your testing uh, with certain testing techniques and methods. And we also have some vertical courses, like if you happen to develop something in the banking and finance domain, uh, which I expect uh, 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 to be the case for many companies in Frankfurt, for example, or automotive. I can think more about Munich uh, in this case, healthcare, AI, uh, machine learning. So we have some vertical courses which are still about Python security or Java security or C sharp security, but with, with some specialities of these domains. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, if there are any questions, I will be happy to uh, answer them. Thank you very much for this interesting webinar. <laughs>
It was very interesting and for our participants also I would like to thank you very much for your time and for attending this webinar. If you would like to dive deeper in this topic as uh, the trainer already mentioned we have a large schedule on our website for further site trainings and yeah we would be happy to welcome you in one of our trainings. Thanks Laura.